What do you think, Doug? Shall we get started? Yeah, let's go. Yeah, okay. Well, listen, folks, uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. There's uh, you know, a few more that may be coming on. I think, uh, Leslie, right off the bat, let's kind of hold the poll. Uh, we can ask that kind of midway through, see if we have other people on. Okay. So, um, I just want to say a very quick good morning. I'm Kathy Sajan. I'm the Executive Director of Christian Foundation of America. And uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction and turn this over to Doug Flagg at Safe Charities uh, in just a moment, but want to ex explain what this is all about. Uh, Christian Foundation of America is a community foundation. We're here to encourage generosity um, and uh, charitable giving for churches, charities, um, uh, helping those in our communities and really helping to build sound community um, uh, for our current um, benefit and as a legacy to pass on to future generations. We recognize that the fabric of community um, is made up of all sorts of things. The hard work of individuals, our faithful folks that are working in formal and informal uh, areas to, uh, uh, to, to help those in need and our business community is an important part of that. So we're really proud to have um, as one of our uh, relationships um, through their corporate responsibility, a company called Safe Kitchens. And what you see before you is their uh, banner for Safe Charities, which is their corporate uh, give back program. And so uh, with all, all, of the, uh, all of the things we're dealing with with coronavirus, um, uh, they have offered to do this educational seminar this morning as information and education only. So um, I'm just really happy to introduce to you all this morning, Doug Flay, he's their vice president for operations. Uh, they're located um, in California, but they can serve in really multiple areas around the country. I'll give a quick introduction about all of that. And the, the last thing I wanna do is just give a shout out to um, how some of you may have heard about this, um, Christian Foundation of America has a communication initiative that we call BLINC, B-L-I-N-C. It stands for Breathing Life into Community, and it's really our way of telling stories, lifting up great work that's going on in our communities. And this is just a great story this morning of a company who wears their faith and uh, their, their desire to help with uh, strong corporate um, uh, business principles, as well as uh, a very strong commitment to charity uh, with a focus on faith communities, but but other charities. So uh, that's just my quick hello. And uh, Doug, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I'm looking forward to learning on this this morning myself. So thanks all for being here. Thanks so much, Kathy. I appreciate that. Um, good morning, everyone. Appreciate you taking some time out of your day to join us. Um, as Kathy mentioned, today's really about education. So we work with a company. So we're, we're a company called um, Safe companies and under our umbrella of companies, we've got some some different brands, safe kitchens, safe workplaces, safe schools, safe solutions, and one of them is safe charities. And this is the way that we give back. We have a real heart to give back to uh, the community. And one of the ways we do that is just educating, you know, uh, uh, faith based organizations and others on how to navigate right uh, this new COVID nineteen world. And um, it's a scary place. There's a lot of data. You, things are changing every day. You're getting conflicting information. You're getting conflictive directions. So today, I just kind of want to walk you through kind of an overview that will help you translate some of that and hopefully come away with some notes on uh, next steps to take when you're thinking about how your organization is going to approach this. Um, so with that, I was going to dive into the agenda. So today, we're going to talk about just generally defining the risks associated with um, you know, cleanliness and a safe environment. I'll tell you a little bit about Safe Charities. Um, we're going to share what we call the defendable program. And this is what we call our kind of a five-step approach um, for how you can make sure that you're protecting your company um, or your organization uh, against these threats um, from multiple aspects. Uh, we have kind of our five, uh, five shield approach and then question and answer period at the end. And if you notice, uh, if you're familiar with Zoom, you know this, but if you aren't, you may not notice that uh, you could actually, on the bar there, you can choose questions and answers and you can type your questions in and I'll tackle those at the end of the presentation today. 
So a lot of you are looking at reopening and how you're going to go ahead and take the right action to move forward uh, with this kind of post-COVID situation. There's a lot of risks, right? You want to make sure that you're protecting your employees, protecting customers. If you're a church or a you know, charity organization, protecting parishioners, et cetera. And then how do, you man- how do you manage that? How do you keep it sustainable? Because a lot of companies are out there and they're sharing like, hey, we'll come in and we'll clean your place. Well, that's great. But as soon as you, the first person walks in, your, your space is contaminated. So what can you do to make sure that you can maintain a healthy, clean, and safe environment for employees? One of the other things that's going to be critically important is, you know, documentation and education. So having a way to say, here's what we've done to protect our employees, our guests, and here's what we're doing about educating our team on how to maintain that. Um, And then there are benefits to maintaining a really clean environment and a safe environment. And that kind of really comes around absenteeism and presenteeism, which is really about uh, minimizing the days off sick days and also making sure that while people are at work, that they're actively engaged. So you get, you know, the most productivity out of, out of their time as well, or in the essence of schools, you reduce the impact to um, absenteeism or students not paying attention because they're not feeling well. So who are we? You know, who, who is this, you know, this guy you're listening to and, and the safe companies company? Well, we're really infection prevention cleaning experts. You know, we bring 25 plus years of industry experience to the space. We're experts in CDC and OSHA uh, standards. Um, we're making sure that um, all products and things that we bring to bear or that, we, that you would want to run by us to say, hey, is this a good product? Should I use this? And we want to be a, you know, a consultant in that front for you, a resource for you. Uh, we'll help you navigate to make sure that you're not getting sold a bill of goods. We're, uh, we've actually been accredited. We've, we've gone through uh, training um, to become accredited infection prevention experts. And we apply that to the stuff we do every day. We're members of several types of associations that are around this, um, uh, that are kind of the, the premier organizations in the world of cleaning and deep cleaning. And we've been actively decontaminating COVID-19 situations for our clients today, a few of which you see here. Let me share a little bit about our team. So uh, John Spock is our CEO and Anthony Barton is our president uh, and founder. And uh, there's me, I'm the vice president of operations. And then we've got Dale, who is our director of training and education. So we do offer training and education programs uh, like what we're doing today, but even more in depth for specifically at uh, locations or teams. And I'll share a little bit more about that later. Uh, but really for us, you know, a big part of our team is going to be, you know, the people that are out in the field doing the work. And here's some examples of some of the jobs and types that we've done as the, on the safe company side. So we know what we're talking about. And because of that, we want to share with you how to navigate this because you're going to have a thousand people in white jumpsuits coming to you saying, hey, we're going to help you clean this up. We'll help you do this. But there's some ways you can screen it to make sure they're really coming with a program that'll meet your needs. And we kind of call that the, the defendable program or cleaning for health and safety. And we kind of see it as a kind of a five point process. It really starts with analyzing your situation. You know, no two spaces are the same. And so you want to make sure that, that um, you're not just getting some cookie cutter approach, but that they're really helping you analyze your situation. What are the specific needs around your organization or your school or church or, um, you know, even for-profit organization? How, how, what issues are you facing in this post-COVID world? So analyzing that and coming up with a plan. And then we call it restoring, and that's really doing the cleaning. And then, and in essence, there's a, I'll break into this a little bit more detail, but it's about setting the baseline. So once you set the baseline, how do you maintain that? And we'll talk a little more about that in detail. You want to have some documentation, what, what was done, what chemicals were used to make sure you're compliant with OSHA guidelines. You may want some training and education. So if you've got a daily cleaning service or a janitor on site, you want to make sure that they're doing things the right way, the best way, and any bad habits are broken. Um, but also using the best tools uh, and chemicals that are available to keep your place safe. And that's part of our long-term sustainability program, which I'll break out in a little bit more detail later on. So terminology, let's talk about this world of cleaning. You've heard everything from virucides to sterile, to clean, to disinfect, to sanitize. So let me kind of make it easy for you. And we'll start start with this uh, first part. So cleaning, that's just literally removing soil. 
So that's your like basic cleaners. Anything you're using to spray on a surface that's removing dirt, may not be disinfecting, may not kill germs, but it makes it look shiny and nice, right? When you sanitize a surface, um, you're lowering the number of bacteria on surfaces to levels that are considered safe, right? And so you're not getting everything, but you're lowering it to a point where, hey, someone touches the surface, they touch their face, they're not getting sick. And then finally, a disinfectant. So disinfectant really kills what you want to kill, your viruses and bugs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's different kinds of, of disinfectants. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about some of the chemicals. But that gives us a baseline. So, you know, cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting. If you're disinfecting or sanitizing without cleaning, it doesn't do any good. It's like painting over a dirty fence, right? It's not going to do any good. And so um, we'll make, want to make sure we always start with cleaning, then sanitizing, then disinfecting. When someone's approaching you or you're looking at this, you want to kind of customize a plan. So um, some things you're going to want to consider when you're thinking about how to approach uh, cleaning or maintaining cleaning in your environment is really um, you know, type of facility. I talked a little bit about that, the size of the facility, the age of the facility. You might have some maintenance and repair issues that are causing health concerns that you might want to address as well. And then what are your current cleaning protocols? So, you know, if someone's coming in and talking to you about what you're doing, are they really looking at what you're doing today or are they just coming with a cookie cutter approach? And you want to make sure that they're giving you feedback on what you're doing today because once they leave, how are you maintaining it? And finally, kind of the culture of the team. You know, we've, we've dealt with organizations where, you know, maybe the cleaning teams are unionized and there's habits that are old and things you have to break and things you have to change. And how is the team going to respond to that? What's the culture of the team? And what's the culture of environment? Are people used to tight workspaces being elbow to elbow? In this new world, you might need to spread out a little bit more. You might have to have some plexiglass barriers. So how's that infecting, impacting the culture of your team? And you, know, you wanna make sure that whoever you're working with or however you're analyzing this, you're addressing the impact to the organization's culture because it will have a change on it. You wanna make sure we're addressing key issues. So anytime you're doing this, there's um, addressing key issues. One of those is kind of what we call high touch points. So these are places in your location that are touched all the time. It could be door handles, it could be um, you know, light switches, uh, uh, any kind of tablets, devices, obviously computer keyboards. Um, those high touch points are the places where any kind of pathogen will tend to reside more than it will on just a wall in a room. So they're generally not on a wall in a room. And if they are, the odds of somebody touching that on the spot, on the wall, in the room where they are, within the time frame that it can survive there is low. But the time they can survive on a keyboard or the time they could survive on a door handle or a light switch with somebody coming in and out of rooms often is a lot more frequent. So when you're thinking about your cleaning plan, um, like at my, my church, we looked at it, and between services, we're making sure to give extra cleaning attention to high touch points because those are the places that where you're gonna have the issues with any kind of residual pathogens. You're thinking about the types of uses within the organization, you know, in your area. You know, restrooms are one of those places where you've gotta give it a little extra attention. Uh, and if you're not, you're just, it could cause problems. I know most people don't know this, but the dirtiest place in a restroom is the soap dispenser. Why is that? Because that's what you're touching with a dirty hand if it's not if it's not touchless, you're touching it with a dirty hand to get the soap, you're washing your hands, and you're not touching it again. And if it's not getting cleaned off, it's just building up on that point. So these are the kind of things you want to consider as you're putting together and analyzing a plan or working with someone to help you do that. When it comes to restoring uh, a place, right, really kind of setting the baseline, uh, we kind of operate in this, in the, with this quote in mind. And it literally says, one professionally educated, certified, well-trained, conscientious custodian or janitor, given the right tools and enough time to do their job, will prevent more disease than a room full of doctors can cure. And it's really true. It's about prevention. So being proactive in the things that you do is really important. And thinking about your people, right? You know, do you have a professional cleaning staff um, that's out there? Are you utilizing somebody to come in to do that? If you are, you want to make sure really they're specialized. Are they really doing the things that you need done for your facility? Are they trained? What kind of certifications do they have that may help with um, looking at uh, your specific facility and the challenges you face? 
um, a commercial kitchen faces different challenges than does uh, a church organization or, um, you know, an oil company or, you know, a general retail store. And so you want to make sure that you're bringing a team in or looking at a team that's got the tools to help you, uh, help you do the best efforts around that. When it comes to restoring, this is kind of the fun part. There's all kinds of different products and methodologies out there. But again, I'm going to go back to cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting, okay? So if you, if you just have somebody come in and they're going to spray a bunch of disinfectant and the place has not been cleaned, it's like waxing a dirty car, painting a dirty fence. It's not going to do any good. In fact, the dirt on the, on the surfaces will suck up the disinfectant and you'll literally neutralize it. So it won't have any effect. So it's just throwing money down the drain. So one of the things that's important to do is make sure you start off with a good deep cleaning. And by deep cleaning, we mean really scrub it down, get that place really sparkling clean. You start at the top, you work your way down, and then you're gonna do some sanitizing. And I'll talk about some ways you can sanitize and, and, and you can perform sanitizing. Um, and then after that's done, that's when you wanna do disinfecting. And that's when you may be using chemicals to disinfect certain services or throughout the, the facility. And I'll share with you some ideas and, and tools around how to do that. Something else that's unique, and this is relatively, it's, it's not super new, but it's relatively new in the world of disinfection, is called barrier products. And what these are, these are products that, um, that are, they go on a surface and they provide ongoing protection. And I'll share a little bit more about how those work a little bit later in the presentation. But the nice thing is, is once you've done your cleaning, and you're disinfecting and you put on these barrier products, um, you know, I'll have a little slide about it later, but it literally creates a bed of nails that, that, that continues to provide protection against, uh, you know, viruses and other kind of uh, pathogens that can cause harm to your guests or employees. Um, so I'll share a little bit more about that. And there's, there's, there's green ones, there's ones that are chemical based or, or ceramic based. And so um, there's a lot of things like that. Most people aren't aware of that, those barrier products can provide three to six months of ongoing protection. And when you wipe over them with a normal cleaning process, you're not necessarily removing them. Um, but they're a great way to make sure that like door handles, light switches, keyboards, other things are working well and not becoming a problem for your organization. Additionally, in your, in your planning or you're thinking about it, one of the things you want to do is be looking at what kind of equipment's being used when you're, when you're working on a, on a solution for your, um, your business? You know, are, are you using, um, you know, uh, air compressors for dusting? Um, on the video there, you're seeing a thing we call um, dry vapor, which literally is superheated steam that doesn't leave any moisture on the site, but actually sanitizes and disinfects for the surfaces that it touches. Um, we use this often in any kind of great hard surfaces, um, stainless steel, you see it being used there. Um, but that is a great tool to do that. One of the things that's being recommended lately by um, both uh, OSHA and CDC is using flip top dispensers instead of your normal spray bottles. And so using a flip top dispenser is less wear and tear on your wrist. And you can pour the, pour the product on and spread it around more evenly. Um, that's definitely one of the ones that's, that's out there that's helpful. One of the things that's interesting um, that, that most people are not aware of is that squeegees are a great way to remove uh, any kind of product you put on a surface, whether it's a disinfectant or a sanitizer. So if you've cleaned a surface and you're gonna now remove the product, and if you don't know, for most disinfectants, when you put them on a surface, they have a dwell time. So you can't just put them on and wipe them off immediately. That's almost like putting conditioner in your hair and rinsing it out immediately. It needs a little time to take effect. Uh, and it says on the label specifically how long it needs to take effect. And so you wanna make sure that you're letting it dwell. Well, once it's done, you wanna use something like a squeegee to remove it. And on flat surfaces, a squeegee beats, microfiber towels beats everything in removing product and getting all those pathogens off. Um, and that's something that, that a lot of teams aren't aware of and they don't know, but is a great way to approach uh, cleaning. You know, dry vapor, I talked about that. That's on the side there. There's lopes bead power scrubbers for floors, which are definitely recommended. Um, electrostatic spraying, you know, there's a lot of people running around in a van with electrostatic sprayers saying they're gonna sanitize your, your, your facility and they're gonna just come in and spray a bunch of stuff. But if they, again, if they haven't cleaned anything first, 
it's not doing any good and you're just throwing your money down the drain. And then there's ways to fog the space too. So while an electrostatic sprayer uh, kind of looks like the dry vapor in a way that you see in the video there, that electrostatic sprayer was a way to, to, to spray on a disinfectant throughout the facility uh, and it electrostatically charges the particles. So even though it looks like they're being sprayed in a specific area, they don't pile up on top of each other. They actually force it to spread out and cover a space. And uh, they work great on you know, everything from upholstery and fabrics um, to cubicle sidings, solid surfaces, et cetera. When you want to employ a fogger unit, um, we, we often use a thing we call chlorine dioxide. And that actually goes up into the HVAC, HVAC system and clears out any uh, pathogens that are lying within your ducting there. And it's a great way to make sure that kind of you have clean air flowing throughout your facility as well. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways to approach this. Chlorine dioxide is one of the ones that we use. So that's kind of some of the tools and technologies we have in approaching, you know, the, uh, the restoring the facility, really getting in and cleaning it, sanitizing, and then disinfecting. And then after that, and I'll talk about it in sustainability, will be when you want to consider things like barrier products. One of the things that's super important is whoever helps you or whatever you're doing, you need documentation. Uh, insurance companies are not generally providing coverage for COVID-19 cases at this point. So I imagine that'll start to change, but there'll probably also be a premium price to make that happen. Because of that, you wanna have some kind of way to ensure that there's not uh, any kind of, um, uh, that you've done your due diligence so that if there is any kind of a claim, you've got documentation that you took steps to, to mitigate the risk. And we, we see that documentation in a few ways, really measuring outcomes. So what do we mean? Well, what process was used to clean your space? Whoever does the work should document their process and be telling you what are the tools they used, what techniques were used. They should have a roster of the crew. You know, they should have a personal protection equipment log. And that's a requirement from OSHA. If you aren't getting that from your cleaning provider, they're not helping you be compliant with OSHA. Um, the proof is also in making sure that they're providing like photos of the, the job in progress so that you can kind of see what they were doing, what areas they were tackling. This is great if you want to share information with employees or guests or put up photos on your website to share, here's what we're doing. Here's how we're doing our part to make this facility safe for you. And then really some before and after photos are great. So I've kind of got a disgusting one here. And this is from a restaurant. This is, their, this is their nozzle over the sink where they're washing dishes. And that thing was just filthy. You know, and it's going to get wear and tear on it. It's going to get nicked up and beat up. But you can see afterwards, once it's cleaned, sanitized, disinfected, that thing looks great. Um, and without just some of the dents and dings, it looks brand new. But this is the kind of stuff that you want to make sure you're documenting and getting from anybody who works with you on uh, your facility. Additionally, um, the, we keep saying the proofs and the outcomes. How do you measure outcomes of the, of the work that was done? Well, one of the ways that you can do that is through what's called ATP test results. ATP testing is a way that you measure the, any kind of residual, um, any kind of residual, um, uh, what do you call them, microbes left by any living organism or virus that was on a surface in the facility. So one of the things that a lot, of locate, a lot of companies are doing now is testing once they've cleaned. They're using a little swab. They're swabbing key surfaces throughout the facility, putting it into their meter, and providing a reading. And in this, this case, you can see the reading came out as one. Anything less than 30 is generally considered um, you know, food quality safe, meaning you can prep food on that surface and nobody's going to get sick. Um, and so that's a great thing. We often get down to zero. We'll be providing reports to customers. We're often down to zero on those numbers, and it's great. Um, but that's the kind of thing you want to do. Here's an example of a location where we took a test ahead of time. I think it's a little dirty with 1,790. I mean, that's, that's just filthy. But after we cleaned it, we got it down to 16. And again, this is the kind of thing you want to do. You share this with, for example, your insurance company and the things that you're doing and showing them proof like this, it goes a long ways in making them feel positive about the steps you're taking to make your facility safe for your guests. The other things you wanna make sure is documenting products. So, you know, if you're, people are using products in, in your location, you wanna make sure that they're providing you with safety data sheets. That's a requirement for any organization that's using any kind of chemical is that you have safety data sheets available. 
so that um, should there be an issue or a claim, um, OSHA is able to come in and say, what chemicals were used? What chemicals were people exposed to here? Uh, because it helps them identify root causes. And by law, you have to have those. So you gotta make sure whoever does cleaning in your location, they give you the safety data sheets for the products that they use. If they don't, they're just setting you up for trouble. And the last thing is you're seeing this, you might be seeing this a little bit more and more, but really the proof is in you know, certifying it. So saying what steps were taken to clean the facility and then communicating that for your employees and guests. And you know, at Safe Companies, we have a way of doing that using our certified decal, um, but it really helps create an environment that, uh, that says, we've been taking steps, we've certified that this place is clean and safe for our guests. But it's all good, you can get that stuff done one time. But if you're not doing something to maintain it, um, you're, not, you're not really um, doing everything you can to make sure that the place is ongoing clean. And one of the key ways to do that is, is considering doing classes either for your internal team or if you're using some kind of outside vendor to do your daily cleaning, making sure that you're getting them educated on what it means to be clean, especially in this post COVID world. Things have changed. The, the, the mow, blow and go approach to cleaning isn't gonna be sufficient any longer. And so you've really got to make sure that the people are using the best practices and are getting trained on how to do things properly. You know, some of the elements of a quality class is just breaking old habits, right? Habit is broken by habit. Um, so changing behaviors, having them involved in live demonstrations. So are they hands-on with the products? Is it interactive? Is it, is it enjoyable? Are they really learning something and are they demonstrating that they understand the habits? And then really some kind of certificate of completion because you wanna be able to go back and say, you were trained on this as the right way to do it, but you're not doing it the right way and bring them back so that you kind of have that constant reminder of how things should be clean. And sometimes habits take time to, to, to break. So educating those teams, whether they're internal or external is gonna be critical. Some of the key things in a, in a good training and education class is gonna be around CDC OSHA standards, kind of personal protective equipment basics, understanding what works, what doesn't, what are the right ways to do things. And then also, um, you know, methodology and system and even personal hygiene. You know, sometimes people forget what it means and, and you know, gloves are one of those things that gives you a false sense of security. I've seen this all the time. I was in a restaurant the other day and the server is serving my food with the gloves on and then turns around, takes a customer's credit card, swipes it right there at the table, does the transaction, right? And then goes and gets other food and brings it out to the customer, never change the gloves. So you just, you're just passing on you know, disease. So understanding how that works, if that credit card had anything on it, then they've just passed on that to whoever they serve food to next. So understanding what works and what doesn't is really important. So that's all great. How do you sustain it? This is really the key. So maintaining the cleanliness is, is the critical part. So one, any training you gave your teams or put into play, those are the things you wanna need, you're gonna to wanna to work on and make sure that you're putting it into practice. The barrier products can help and I have a slide on that in just a minute, I'll go into more detail. And then ongoing documentation. So I talked about ATP testing. So there's organizations that are able to come in after that's done on a regular basis and test ongoing like high touch points, door handles, light switches, keyboards, to make sure that the cleanliness and the practices you're doing are being, are being carried on and that they're being effective, so measuring the outcomes, and then also documenting that over time. So that if it's time for another deep cleaning or another, sand, uh, another disinfection cycle on a quarterly basis, that might be something that you want to consider or dive into. That's kind of the, those are kind of some of the keys there. And then of course we talked about that, just ongoing documenting what it is you're doing and what are the outcomes of that are going to be critical in sustaining it. What gets measured gets done. So again, making sure that whatever team it is, internal, external, they've got the right tools to succeed, that they're using the right products, and that there's follow-up happening. That's key in sustaining it because you're probably not going to spend money on a company coming in and doing that deep cleaning every week. It's just usually not economically feasible. So whoever is doing the regular cleaning, making sure that they're doing it the most effective way with the most effective tools is going to be important to sustaining a clean environment. The antimicrobial barrier products are, are, are awesome as well. So they provide extended protection, somewhere from three to six months, 
uh, depending on the use or you know the frequency of touch on the space. So a door handle usually lasts about three months before you have to do a reapplication of it. Um, and it can prevent growth. Um, it really like works like a bed of nails. So I describe it this way. You like the bed of nails is there. Here comes that little COVID guy. He lands on it and boom, it penetrates the envelope. And you've probably heard about enveloped viruses and all these other terms, and it just destroys it. So there's different ways to do it. There's green approaches, which is actually like putting um, good bacteria on surfaces that eats bad bacteria and anything else on the surface and provides ongoing protection to the ceramic coating, which is more like a bed of nails that pr provides ongoing protection for your staff and employees. Best applied to high touch point locations, not just necessarily everywhere. And then of course, sustainable documentation. There's ongoing liability and obligation. Therefore, establishing the standards like we talked about, regular monthly measuring of those standards, and then monitoring it over time. So you've got a track record of excellence in keeping your facility safe and maintained is, is important. And then really adjust as needed, right? It's kind of that plan do see model where you're just continuing to, to go, okay, we didn't get the cleaning results we wanted this month. What are we doing differently? Where are we gonna change? Is it time for a reset um, and, and diving a little deeper? Sometimes we talk about it's like washing or waxing your car. You know, you might get the car washed once a week, but really maybe once a quarter, you're getting that deep cleaning waxing done on the car to keep it at peak, peak condition. But you're not paying for a waxing, you know, once a week. It's just too frequent. And so kind of looking at it the same way in your cleaning approach, the daily things, are we doing those like the basic wash? And is it time to get a deeper waxing and a deeper detailed cleaning of, the, of um, our location? So as I talked about, just kind of to recap, the Defendable Program understands the risks and how to mitigate them. It builds an analysis around how to do, how to tackle, tackle this in your specific location. It executes the restoration, documents it, so you have something to prove. Here's the things we did and to share with your employees and guests. You're providing some training and education for your internal, external team. And then you've got a sustainable program that keeps it, you know, and really the question is, how do you plan to audit the outcomes in your facility? So that's our whole presentation today. And I'm actually happy to field any questions uh, you may have that uh, around, um, around the cleaning or you know, post COVID or some of the guidelines CDC and OSHA are putting out. So I don't see any typed in here, um, Leslie, yet, but I guess we could open it up to see if there's any questions people have. There was a question that came over through email. Uh, and that question to you, Doug, is uh, it was from a pastor and the pastor shares the facility on Sunday morning. And mm -hmm. so, you know, um, there's a church service that meets before them, then they come in at 1030. And there's another church service that comes in after them. So his question was, um, what responsibility is for them to clean the before and the after the service. Right, right. So I would say for them, um, they're going to probably want to coordinate with the before and after group. Okay. And maybe it's the, 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 the group before them is doing some cleaning and they're picking it up before they start their service and doing a little bit more, but there needs to be coordination there. Uh, most church organizations that have multiple services back to back or with some kind of a gap between them, they're, they've got a full cleaning protocol in place between services that they're providing um, that includes wiping down high touch points, recleaning restrooms, um, uh, sanitizing pens if they're being used, probably have moved away from um, offering plates or passing offering plates or communion elements to um, uh, people picking those up when they come in. Um, so you're going to want to have some kind of a way to do that. It's going to work coordination with groups before and after. If the other groups aren't willing to coordinate, you're going to have to probably clean it <laughs> ahead of time before your, your group comes in and then go ahead and uh, clean it up afterwards so it's, it's clean and safe for the next group. Again, it doesn't have to be a super deep cleaning if that's been done during the week or during normal periods. Uh, it's about making sure that it's ready between groups. So in essence, think about servers between tables. Now you're, instead of just wiping a table down, you're doing a little more disinfecting using the right chemicals between um, customers and making sure that everything is ready and safe. You're providing new utensils, so new pens, things like that uh, between each of the groups. 
Fantastic. Yeah, thank you for that. <clears throat> I got, got a question. It's, it's, it's sort of along the same veins, but it's, you know, it's kind of thinking about the, you know, this whole coordination and the fact that anybody who manages a facility, whether you own it or you're a renter in a facility, you've got that aspect of coordination. Right. Um, you know, and, and especially in a church context, but, you know, we, we have an operation where at some point we'll invite people back in for a, a meeting with social distancing and all of that. But it's the question of, um, it's, it's the tension we're seeing kind of out there about what we can require people to do, what we can encourage them to do. And so it's kind of the bottom line, which picks up on your education piece is, um, are you seeing or are you guys being asked or, you know, are you seeing trends out there in what organizations like churches or, you know, anybody that's got people coming in restaurants or shops, what they're doing beyond just the, you know, the poster on the wall to um, encourage their patrons about what you're doing and what we ask that they'll do to be a part of it, right? We want this to all feel like it is a community process and that there's encouragement and I think sort of the social reward of everybody chipping in together. But I'm just wondering, you know, this is such a kind of a new thing for us, right? The, the one thing right. ever pandemic that everybody knows about. Mm -hmm. What kinds of questions are you getting about that? How are you seeing people respond? And, and, and there's got to be the practicality. And I'll just put one more thing in that. Uh, you know, every business is trying to, you know, maintain positive margin in the not-for-profit yep. world where there's this mission focus. People are wanting to leverage every last dollar to, you know, the services or the programs or, you know, in the case of our church is God's word being shared. Yep. Um, and so, you know, it's like, how do you incorporate all of this in a way that uh, doesn't detract and, um is defendable in terms of expectations of everybody? It's a big question, but. No, it's a great question. So, <clears throat> so I'll answer it from a business perspective, then I'll answer it from kind of that nonprofit perspective. So um, one of the tough things with social distancing is, is that if you're a restaurant <clears throat> and you have a capacity of 100 people in your restaurant and the tables were fairly close together, you've probably halved your capacity, which probably halves your sales volume potential. Um, and that, Unless you were operating, and if you were operating at fifty percent margins, now you're just breaking. Now you're just breaking even because yeah. you can't crank the volume through. So we're seeing a trend where um, they're trying to put people enough people in the same amount of space, or expand into outdoor spaces to accommodate more people, um, or putting up more plexiglass barriers between folks or between tables, so they can still get the same number of people in, or maybe only lose one or two tables, but still provide some kind of protections. Um, so we're seeing a lot of different ways to approach that. A lot of it is about shifting or expanding the space so that you have more space between people. When it comes to nonprofit, I think you've got to look at your, you know, where your guests, where, where your, your parishioners are at. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> so there's one church that we worked with where you've got, uh, it's, it's a very uh, interge or intergenerational church. So you've got people that are probably on the uh, older age and higher risk that are more sensitive. And then you've got people that are younger that are like, yeah, whatever, we're good. And then a lot of families with kids. How do you do all that, right? And so this church in particular uh, set up different spaces throughout the, the campus. So this area that was easy access from the parking lot was, you know, mass required, you know, um, kind of where high risk people, if they wanted to attend, could attend here. And they, they video cast the sermon into that room and made it available for people. And they could get to that room in and out without, you know, necessarily running through a lot of folks. Um, so easy to their cars if there was high risk. The other one is, uh, and then they made another area in the main sanctuary where coming in, you get your temperature taken, right? So they know you're not running a fever, but it was a, it was a no, no masks required. You know, you could wear a mask if you want, but not required. And um, that was the main, main worship service. And then they also had an outdoor seating area. And in the Southern California climate, that can work. Uh, and they had video screen out there so people could sit outdoors and that was, you know, uh, made available as well. They didn't have, hadn't started kids Sunday school classes yet or kids church yet. So the kids were sitting with their families and even in the sanctuary, they created spacing where it looked like a, 
looked like a first class area of an airline passenger plane. Instead of rows of chairs tight together, they were spread out, there was more leg room. So you had distancing, but family groups could sit together mm -hmm. uh, pretty comfortably. So those are some of the ways that they're approaching it. But you're right, it, it is hard. It, it may require looking at how your chemical spend is um, today. One of the things that we've seen is people are buying like Windex and you know some kind of regular cleaner and some kind of like they're buying all this different stuff. And there's products that can take like four of those and put it into one. So you could use the same product for cleaning windows, cleaning surfaces, cleaning these things, and it sanitizes. And, in oft and oftentimes can even disinfect. And so instead of buying at retail price these other products, you could buy it more like distributor costs a product that could cover and eliminate those things. So we've actually been able to help companies reduce their spend on chemicals, which is one of those things you don't look at until something like this happens. And you're like, ah, oh, that's where we're spending all our money in our janitorial services. And so also looking at the, pro the tools you're using, like what kind of mops are you using? What kind of brooms are you using? How, you know, all those kind of things are the things that you want to look at for making sure that um, you're, you're reducing your spend because there's probably going to be some offsetting labor that goes into some of this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, I guess not today. So, but appreciate everybody being on and uh, time. Uh, yeah. We do have a poll actually oh, yeah. to our participants. If you wouldn't mind, we have a quick uh, two question poll that we would love to get your answers. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, there are multiple choice, but I will go ahead and launch that poll now. So if you'd uh, give us your answers, that would be fantastic. Thank you for joining us today and we appreciate your input. Kathy, again, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, again, if if uh, if anyone is is uh, interested um, in having some more time or or, or consultation, we could be available. Um, you could find us on the web. Um, but today, hopefully, this was educational for you and helps you in your planning process um, in understanding how to approach um, kind of this post COVID nineteen world. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to hit the share results on that. And, uh, you know, I just want to say again, thank you for everybody for being on this call. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the top subjects of the summer for us. And uh, it's phenomenal uh, what you guys are doing. And I know that your commitment through Safe Charities to uh, do this kind of education and to actually, you know, uh, think about, um, you know, how you can support charities with uh, the profits in your company. And so, you know, we're grateful for the relationship with you guys, grateful for the time you're spending putting this together. And, you know, we'll talk afterwards, but we've recorded this and, you know, uh, we'd love to be able to share it through our Blink communications and uh, just bless others with this information. And so thank you all for being here today. Thanks so much, Doug. This was a great presentation. I'm going to well, buy another squeegee, that's for sure, so. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. Great I appreciate tip. it. And you guys have a, uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thanks you. so much.